Hey, good morning. Good morning. It's Tuesday morning and I am Israel Wendy. And we are going to have um, uh, evangelist George Dyer come and do a teaching this morning. So hang on just a second while uh, George gets set up here. God bless you guys. Thank you, uh, replay viewers. Uh, thank you for joining the scope. And God bless you. your chair up or more towards the future. Let's do it so we don't cut the there we go. Good morning. It's sure good to be with you again this morning. I always count it a joy to be able to share the word of God and to uh, let people know that there is hope. There is hope in this world. The title of today's study is a new chance at life or a new opportunity at life. Have you ever gone so far and fell back so far that you thought that you would never, ever, ever have any hope? And that God has washed his hands of you and that you're done? Well, good news is that uh, God's never done with you. He loves you and he does have a plan for your life. And he loves you with an everlasting love. He loves you with an unconditional love. And I want to encourage you this morning. If you feel that you've gone so far, that God could never forgive you. Just remember what the Apostle Paul said. He said he declared himself as the chief of sinners, and God forgave him and made him an apostle and also uh, enabled him to write almost, what was it, two-thirds of the New Testament. Well, this morning I want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is a powerful portion of scripture. I love it. And I'm going to go down through it verse by verse. How long I'll preach, how long I'll teach this morning, I don't know. It's up to the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's up to him to uh, lead and direct. And so I trust that if you know somebody that is hurting, somebody that needs hope, somebody that needs salvation, somebody that needs deliverance, that you go ahead and get in contact with them and have them come and listen to this broadcast. Now, it makes no difference what religion you are. It makes no difference where you come from. The Word of God is solid. The Word of God is sure. The Word of God is pure. And it's good for everyone. I mean everyone. Now, in Romans chapter 8, it starts off, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Well, let me go back here. It says no condemnation. When Jesus Christ hung on that cross, he paid the ultimate price. The ultimate price. And those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we need to remember this and not ever take it for granted. So many times Christians say, oh yeah, I know Jesus. I've been saved for 50 years or 60 years. We just sort of take it for granted. But he never took it for granted and he'd been around for eternity, past and through eternity plus. It says, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The answer is Christ. As he hung on that cross, he took care of all the sins. Amen? Are you listening? He took care of all sins, the past sin, sins of the present, and any sin in the future. Once you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior, he becomes your Lord and your Savior, and he wipes away all sin. Let me emphasize that again. All sin sin, the past, the present, and the future. And he places you into what's called the body of Christ. So now he's given you a new name, a name which uh, I like to refer to as an ambassador of heaven, an ambassador of God. 
a new creation. Now, people sin. Christians sin. And when they sin, does that mean that they're no longer in Christ? Does that mean that they've lost their salvation? Does that mean that uh, God no longer has any use for them? No. That's a lie from the pits of hell. From the pits of hell. I don't care what you've done after you become saved. You don't lose your salvation. Now, a lot of people disagree with me on that, but that's their privilege. I'm just teaching what the Word of God says. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says very clearly that there is a blood covenant that's made between God, uh, the Father, through, uh, through Jesus Christ, with the person that trusts him. And that blood covenant, if you know anything about covenants, you know once God makes a covenant, he stands by his covenant. And he has made a covenant and a promise, and he said, whosoever shall call upon me shall be saved. So if you've called upon God, you have a covenant with God the Father, Almighty God, Elohim, that through his son Jesus Christ, you have an everlasting relationship. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. It says, and this is the record. That is a legal document that God has put in Scripture. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life and that this life is in his son, and that you could believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, some people say, well, the word of God is not it was written by man, so how can we trust it? Well, the Holy Spirit spoke through man as they were directed by God, as Second Peter uh, chapter 1 points that out. And I believe with all my heart, this does not contain the Bible. The Bible does not contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It's God's Word put on paper for us. And God has said in His Word that there is no condemnation. Our worst enemy is ourselves. We blame ourselves. We condemn ourselves. And if God doesn't remember that sin or those things that we are doing in our lives that are wrong, then we have no business in condemning ourselves. Because God doesn't even know what you're talking about. Now, let me encourage you this. I don't know where you stand with God, but it's time, it's time to renew your commitment to Jesus Christ. It's very important that we understand that the time is short. I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is coming again soon. Now, I believe in the pre-tribulational view of the scriptures. Now, I understand that a lot of people don't. I see in scripture where the next agenda on God's timetable is what's called the rapture or the taking away of the bride of Christ to heaven. And then during the seven year period of known as the tribulation, God is going to work in the heart of the Israeli people and draw them back to himself. So that's why I believe that there's a pre trib. God takes his bride out so he can work with his people Israel, who were once called the, the Bride of Jehovah. And they divorced themselves, as Jeremiah says, and they did not want anything more to do with God. But aren't you glad that God never said, I'm done with Israel? God blesses the nation of Israel, and we ought to love the nation of Israel. We ought to love uh, this people, I mean, it's the country, it's the people that our Savior came from. Amen. Now, let's go on here a little bit farther. It says, now there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The word Christ, remember, means anointed one. Jesus represents the word Yahweh, or it also means salvation or Savior. Now, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Once you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, like I had said before, we may sin, but once we sin and we make mistakes and we blow it, as we say, we feel miserable. Yes, me too. I feel miserable. And if you don't feel miserable, there's something wrong in your relationship with God. That's why it says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit or after the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction in our lives. Now, let me challenge you in this way right now. 
uh, we are our war own worst enemy sometimes. Uh, we need to understand that once we become saved, born again, the Holy Spirit lives within us. Our bodies become the temple of God. He lives within us. We don't have to call him down from millions and millions of miles away to come and live. He's living right within sight of us. So when we blow it, then what we need to do is we, say, we go to God and we say, Lord God, I have done fill in the blank. I repent of that or I turn from that. And I ask you to be the Lord of my life. Give me the strength not to do it again. Now, this may happen five or six hundred times. It may happen only once. But either way, the Holy Spirit will lead you. He'll guide you. He'll direct you. And God never gets tired of hearing his children cry out to him for help. There's a lot more that I could say here, but let's move on to verse 2. And it says, In the law of the Spirit of life, in Jesus Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The soul that sins, it'll die, the scripture says. And when Jesus died on that cross, he paid the ultimate price. He fulfilled what the law required. The law requires death for sin, and he paid the ultimate price. He paid the ultimate price, and uh, death was paid. And as a result of that death, he was buried three days and he rose again. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He rose again. And we have the ultimate victory. The ultimate victory. And it says, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. How could it be weak? Well, you see, the law is the schoolmaster that is designed to bring us to Christ. Through the law, we realize that we've fallen short. It's through the law we realize that we have a, a, a debt that we cannot pay. Aren't you glad this morning? Hallelujah. Glory to God that he paid that price in full. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But what the law could not do, God sent his own son and says in verse 3, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. And let me just say this to you this morning. As I share this with you, God the Father allowed the Son to come to earth. And yes, when Jesus came to earth, he was 100% God and he was 100% man. And when he went to that cross, the 100% man took on the sin of mankind. He was pure. He was pure as sin is passed down from Adam through man. Jesus Christ was not the product of a man, but he was a product of the inception of the Holy Spirit into Mary. And as a result, we find that there is a pure, pure sacrifice, and he is known as the Lamb of God. And of course, sin requires uh, a sacrifice. It requires blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so Jesus Christ shed his blood. The Lamb of God shed his blood. And the unique thing is it was at the same time that the high priest were busy sacrificing their uh, lamb on their altar, Jesus Christ sacrificed himself, the pure Lamb of God. And the temple was rent in, twice, or in twain, it says in Scripture, or rent in two from the top to the bottom. And man had access now into the holiest of holies. So where is man going to go? Where is he going to go? Well, he's going to go in us. Jesus is going to go. Or rather, where is God going to go now? Because he was in the holiest of holies. Now, where is God going to go? He's going to go in us. And the scriptures teach about as when we become saved, like I had said, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. And that's where he lives today for those that are born again. Now, let me move on here a little bit further. It says, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Holy Spirit. So righteousness means right living. We can't live right, friend. We can't live right without the Holy Spirit leading us and directing us and guiding us. 
It's so important we understand this. It's so important that we don't give up on God. Now, today we have well, people, and they think all kinds of things. They have all kinds of plans and programs and books and DVDs and so on and so forth and how to live for God. And that's all well and good as long as they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you, if you want to live for God, surrender yourself and allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life. How do you do that? How do you surrender? You basically just throw up your hands and say, Lord God, I've had it. I can't do anymore. I've tried to live for you in my flesh and I failed miserably. And I invite you to come into my life and to be my Lord, to direct me, to lead me, to guide me, to direct me. Give me ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to have compassion. The world is hurting so bad today, friend. Maybe you're hurting so bad today and you don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. Let me encourage you, come to Jesus. Jesus loves you. His arms are open unto you. It makes no difference what you've done. It makes no difference. The blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient enough to forgive you and give you a new life. A new life, a brand new life. Don't become disgusted with God. It's not God's fault. God loves you. He has his arms wide open. But what does man do? Man looks to alcohol. He looks to drugs. He looks to sex. He looks to all these other different things to find satisfaction for his life. And when they only satisfy for a short time and then they come up short on the end of the stick, what are they going to do? Where are they going to go? What do they have? They have nothing. Well, the good news is this, that when you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, he comes in and he gives you that life. And there is always that joy, that peace that passes all understanding. That's why Satan hates it so much. That's why he hates Jesus so much. That's why he hates anyone who stands for Jesus Christ so much is because they are representing the true God of heaven. The true God of heaven is not Allah. I'm sorry. It is Elohim. And there is a difference. There is a movement today out there called Chrislam. And this movement that's out there today combines uh, Islam with Christianity. I'm not going to get into that study today, but I will say this. That the Islamic religion is one thing. Christianity is another thing. And Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Didn't become the Son of God, always has been the Son of God. And it's a triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each one has a function. Each one has a purpose. But it's a triune Godhead, the three in one. And that's another thing we'll talk about someday, maybe. Well, it says the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in verse 4 in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Now let's talk about this for a second. The flesh has a desire, and that desire is to fulfill the desires of their heart. There's a difference between lust, and there's a difference between love. Lust wants to fulfill your own needs at all expense and at all costs. Love always thinks of the other. Always thinks of the other. And for the Christian, it's not what I want from God, it's what God wants for me. And we uh, desire to go after God, we desire to fulfill God, we desire to, to uh, fulfill the desires that he has for us. Now, that's so important for us to understand. It's not about us anymore. It's about God. What do you want for me, Lord? Where do you want to send me? What purpose do you have for my life? Let's move on here a little bit farther. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded, that's fleshly minded, is death. We live after the flesh. It says that we're going to die. We're going to die. The end of the road 
for the carnal mind is death. And not only a physical death, but a spiritual death as well. Is enmity or hatred against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can be. A person that says that they're a Christian and lives after the flesh and to fulfill the flesh needs to go back and really realize and, and evaluate when he made that decision for Jesus Christ. Today, we have a lot of people that are quick to say, oh, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. In Jesus' name, I'm saved. They may be, but nine times out of ten, they're not because there's no repentance. At 16 years old, I prayed a prayer like that. And for 10 years, 10 years, I played the life of the hypocrite. When I was in church, I lived like the top-notch Christian, sang the right song, carried the right Bible, tithed, sang everything. But when I was with the unsaved, I did the opposite. I, I sang the songs of the world and the, did the ways of the world. I drank and I caroused and I did all kinds of things like that. And, and then when... Uh, Time came right, I confessed it. Lord God, forgive me and start me over again. I was all right for a while and then I went right back to it. And this was a, a period of time that this went on. Finally, one day God said to me, he says, George, he says, I've had it with you. Well, that doesn't mean that God gave up on me, but it, the thing is, he says, it's time for you, George, to really count the cost. Are you really a Christian? Do you really mean business for me? If you do, he says, then now is the time to anchor that. And so that night at the, at the Bethel Baptist Church, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. I repented of my sin, turned from my sin, and asked Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. So to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. We want peace today. We all desire to have peace. We're looking for peace, 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 peace accord, peace treaties. All kinds of things. The one that gives the peace that passes all understanding is Jesus Christ. And I realize sometimes to put your faith in Jesus Christ might cost you your life. That may very well happen. But listen, it cost Jesus Christ his life when he went to that cross for us. He loved us that much. He could have let us all die and go straight to hell. But he didn't. He gave his life for us. Well, there's so much in this chapter here. It says, so they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So you want to please God? Learn to live in the Holy Spirit. But he says here in verse 9, it says, he's talking to the Christian here. He says, but you are not after the flesh, but in the Spirit. That's in the Holy Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He is none of his. So, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, it says you do not belong to God. Now, how do you get the Holy Spirit? You get the Holy Spirit by putting your faith in Jesus Christ and asking him to come into your life. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. Now, there's so much more to cover here, but I want to go toward the end of the chapter. Uh, this is a powerful, powerful chapter here, and it's, it's worth reading all of it by all means. But let me just go here toward the end. And this is what I, I love this portion of Scripture. And these are things, these are promises that we can uh, claim for God. What shall we say then, verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Stop and think about it. Who can be against us? Question mark. If God is for you, and how, is, how do you know if God's for you? If you're living for God, it says they that live in the flesh cannot please God. So if you're living in the spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you have the promise, if God be for us, who can be against us? You know, somebody could take a gun out and shoot me right now. You say, well, he wasn't with you there. Yes, he was. Because absent from the body, present with the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, 
how shall he not with him also freely give us notice all things? All things. He delivered. God the Father lifted up the Son, and he gave the Son the permission to give us all things. Stop and think about that. Look at Philippians chapter 3 sometime. The power of the resurrection. Can we lay hands on people today and see them rise from the dead? Yes, we can. I've seen it in my own life. Can we pray for people that are sick and, and uh, command the sickness to go from their bodies and they become healed? Yes. Yes, I've seen it in my own life and I've seen it with others. Yes, we have that ability. They have that power. All things. All things. Creative miracle. You say, well, that can't happen. Well, it did happen. I was pastor and this little boy came in. Little boy had uh, no pancreas, no, uh, what was it, pituitary gland. He had no pituitary gland. His mother had gone to several churches and had him pray. Still, no pituitary gland. And he come to, she come to me and she says, Pastor, she said, would you please pray for Eddie? Eddie has no pituitary gland and he has to go back to the doctor today. And they're going to try to decide what they're going to do. Would you pray? And I said to her, I said, do you believe with all your heart that God will heal your son? She says, yes, I do. So I went ahead and prayed and I spoke. I said, in the name of Jesus, I speak a pituitary gland into Eddie right now. Thank you, Lord, for putting that in Eddie. Well, Eddie went to the doctor. And now listen, he had a portfolio that was three inches thick of x-rays, MRIs, and everything else that said that he did not have a pituitary gland. He went to the doctor the day after we prayed, and God, through the power of the Holy Spirit and all glory to God, he saw the doctor saw a functioning pituitary gland in that boy. Now that's my God. That's my God. He's not made out of stone. He's not made out of plastic. He's not a tree branch. He's not an animal. My God is the living, true, holy God. And he can create today. And all we are is vessels. We speak the words that God gives us, and God does the work. Glory to God. All praise to God. But he says, notice, he says he gives us freely, freely, also freely gives us all things. All things. That's another message sometime later down the road. And it says, who shall lay anything charged against God's elect or selected? It is God that justifies. He who, uh, who is he that condemns? Verse 34. It is Christ that died. Yes, rather it is he is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God and also makes intercession for us. You say, well, I don't have anybody. I don't belong to a church. I don't have anybody. I don't know any Christian. Who's going to pray for me? It says right here that Jesus Christ will pray for you. You can't get a better intercessor than Jesus Christ. Then it says, verse 35, and I want you to listen to this as we wind this up for the next five verses, maybe five hours or maybe five minutes. I don't know. But notice what it says in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Look at verse 37. It says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Notice, more than a conqueror. We have defeated Satan. And all his principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, etc., we have defeated him through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, if any of you that are in witchcraft, any of you that are listening are involved with rites and practices that are the occult or the dark side, let me tell you this you're defeated through the blood of Jesus Christ, and we have the victory. We have the victory in Jesus' name. And your knees will bow one day to the Lord God Almighty, Philippians chapter 2. Let me encourage you, if you're involved with that kind of stuff, surrender right now, repent of your sin, 
and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life, and he will set you free. He'll give you a new chance on life, and you'll be on the victory side, not a hope so, but a no so life. It says in verse, as we go down through here a little bit farther, in verse 38, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, see, I told you, nor things present or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Why wouldn't somebody want an eternal life, forgiveness of sins, a full life on this earth, and put their faith in Jesus Christ? But many today would rather take the broad way that leads to the good times, the fun times, and neglect the narrow way that comes through Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you, listener. Let me encourage you very seriously this morning. If you want a new life and a new beginning, you're sick of the drugs, you're sick of the alcohol, you're sick of the, the sex, you're sick of all these things that you're looking to for peace and joy and happiness, I'm begging you in the name of Jesus, look to Jesus Christ. Look to him. He'll fill the void and he'll give you a life like you've never known. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Of course, if you're driving down the road, you can't do that. <laughs> but pray with me this simple prayer. Lord God, I realize that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. I realize you paid the ultimate price, the ultimate price, by giving your son. And as he gave his life for our sin, and so that we could have a victorious life, I repent of my sin right now. I realize that baptism, church membership, giving big offerings, and doing religious things cannot save me. But I give my heart to you, Lord Jesus Christ, and I ask you to come into my heart and save me. If you prayed that prayer, friend, and you meant it from your heart, and you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, he has saved you. And I encourage you to tell somebody about your decision. They may like it. They may not like it. But tell somebody what Jesus has done in you. Now let's pray also for you, Christian. Let's pray for you for a recommitment, a rededication of your life to Jesus. Father, we dedicate ourselves afresh and anew to you today. We thank you, we praise you, we give you all honor and all glory for saving us and keeping us. Today, Lord God, help us to have ears to hear the Holy Spirit's leading and direction for our lives. Lead us in the way which would bring glory to your name. We commit ourselves to you and to your leading and direction. Help us to stand strong, help us to stand firm, Help us never to be ashamed of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening uh, this morning. It was a joy. It was a privilege. And I look forward to talking with you again here very, very soon. And I want to thank Wendy also, Israel Wendy, for allowing me this privilege. I know we covered some heavy things today. But you know, there are things that need to be covered. They're right from the word of God. I do not apologize for that. But I give God all the glory and I give him all the praise. Well, I got to run. I'll catch you later. God bless you. Now, before you go, George, um, one of the viewers asked a question. Now, if you can answer this quickly, uh, this may be for another scope. So. Okay, the question that was asked was, what are the origins of Christianity? That's a good question. Well, the origins of, of Christianity, it goes, well, it goes all the way back, uh, basically, to the cross. I mean, I could get into Abraham and Isaac and so forth, and that was the patriarchs, and how they came up through, 
and how the bloodlines lined up because the Israeli, Israeli law stated that in order to take the throne, there had to be a bloodline to the throne. There was a man by the name of Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim was a king. He did not like what was written in the Word of God, it says, so he took a pen knife out and cut out that section of the scriptures that he did not like. It's like a lot of people do today, you know. But he cut that portion of scripture out, and when he did that, the bloodline to the throne went from uh, Joseph's side over to Mary's side. And it came on down through. And when Christianity started, of course, uh, was, you know, uh, after Jesus came, he paid the price and so forth like that. And it says in the scriptures that it was in Antioch where they were first called Christians, but they were called believers, you know, prior to that. There's a lot more involved with that particular question, question and I'd be glad to answer that more in detail if you would like, but it was in Antioch where they were first called Christian. Christianity is a belief system based on the word Christ, Christ in us, and that's where Christianity began. Now, there was deviations from that and so forth like that over the years when people got their eyes off of God and on demand, but it was originally, it was originally founded, you know, after Pentecost, the church was founded and so forth like that, and it was, they were called Christians at Antioch. I hope I answered your question. Thank you for asking it. Well, praise God. Thank you for that, George. And uh, we will see you again next time on, uh, I don't know if you want to do it another Tuesday or uh, when you might want to come back, but... You guys be watching for that uh, scope to come on. It usually is on a Tuesday. so I'm looking forward to coming back on a regular basis. So possibly next Tuesday would be a good time that uh, I'll be back on the air. God bless you.